Bad interviews happen. Sometimes celebs are just having an off day or they grow tired of the same questions or even spill info they shouldn't be sharing. Whatever the case may be, these stars all opened their mouths and inserted their feet during interviews, and it cost them big in terms of their careers. Megan Fox In 2009, Megan Fox told Wonderland magazine of her Transformers director Michael Bay. Bay is like Napoleon, and he wants to create this insane, infamous madman reputation. He wants to be like Hitler on his sets, and he is. Calling him a nightmare to work for, she continued, he has no social skills at all, he's vulnerable and fragile in real life, and then on set, he's a tyrant. Sam? Michaela. Is that your girlfriend? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Ex. As a result of her flippant remark, Fox was fired from Transformers and was exiled to cameos and small roles in Friends with Kids and This Is 40. It wasn't until she apologized to Bay that she was allowed to star in his Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise. Bay later told GQ that it was actually Steven Spielberg who demanded that Fox be fired, but he added that she may not have been the most professional actress on set, alleging, "...she was in a different world on her Blackberry. You gotta stay focused. And you know, the Hitler thing? I wasn't hurt because Megan loves to get a response. And she does it in kind of the wrong way." He then added, "...I'm sorry, Megan. I'm sorry I made you work 12 hours. I'm sorry that I'm making you show up on time. Movies are not always warm and fuzzy." Katherine Heigl Knocked Up put Katherine Heigl on the map, and the movie was well-received. By everyone but Heigl, it seemed. In January 2008's Vanity Fair, Heigl griped that the movie was a little sexist. She said, "...it paints the women as shrews, as humorless and uptight, and it paints the men as lovable, goofy, fun-loving guys. It exaggerated the characters, and I had a hard time with it. I'm playing such a bitch. Why is she being such a killjoy? Why is this how you're portraying women?" That comment, combined with her remarks about the writing in Grey's Anatomy, as well as her reputation for being difficult to work with, led the actress to bid parts in a cat litter commercial before the failed state of affairs and doubt. Heigl later lamented to Howard Stern that Vanity Fair published only a portion of her knocked-up remarks, saying, "...that can be the nature of broad comedy. They're exaggerating stereotypes, mm -hmm. that's what makes it funny. Um, I did but they just back. took the sexist thing out." John Mayer John Mayer's reputation never fully recovered after his February 2010 Playboy interview, and his single charting hasn't either. Mayer told the mag he hoped to someday write adult films and claimed ex-girlfriend Jennifer Aniston was, quote, "...hoping it goes back to 1998." He also made a remark about only dating white women, and at one point, he even dropped the N-word. His most infamous remarks, though, were about his ex, Jessica Simpson. Comparing being intimate with her to using drugs, he said, "...it was like napalm, sexual napalm." Implying that Simpson had made him, quote, "...want to quit the rest of his life in addition to a slew of other unreprintable sentiments." Tannenbaum recalled of their meeting, "...when I met Mayer in the kitchen of his L.A. home, he was talking about not talking anymore. I think the world would be better off if I stopped doing interviews." He might be right about that. Paula Abdul in January 2007, ahead of the sixth season of American Idol, Judge Paula Abdul wobbled, swayed, and slurred through an interview which went viral almost instantly. What do Idol fans have to look forward to this season, and what are you looking forward to seeing? Well, is that what it is? She later explained of the incident that she had been doing a series of press junkets, saying, well you're, well, you're in that one little room, and you're looking at one camera, and there are 30 cities talking into your right, ear. Right, exactly. She denied any alcohol or drug use, explaining it as, I guess it was Alabama was in my ear and so was Seattle at the same time, so right. I'm answering questions to the wrong answers of the cities. <laughs> the Fox affiliate that conducted the interview corroborated Abdul's explanation, saying, Rather than getting angry about these difficulties, Paula forged ahead and decided to have fun with the increasingly challenging situation. Unfortunately, because reporters and viewers were unaware of the situation, her humor was misconstrued. Two years later, Abdul failed to negotiate a new American Idol contract, and her loopy reputation stuck for years until she nabbed a judging role on So You Think You Can Dance in 2013. Let's face it, every performer has a bad show here and there. Whether we're talking technical malfunctions, sudden illness, or just plain choking under pressure, there are a myriad of ways things can go wrong in front of a live audience. But for the stars on this list, things didn't just go wrong, they went completely off the rails. These are the live performances that destroyed these artists' careers. Ashley Simpson Using a backing track is common practice for live performers, but only if that track happens to be for the song the artist is currently singing. 
That was the hitch when Ashley Simpson was ready to belt out autobiography for the second song of her 2004 SNL debut. The track for Pieces of Me started playing instead. What followed was an excruciatingly awkward moment, which became her now infamous hoedown dance. Regardless of why it really happened, Simpson's rising music career hit the skids almost immediately. Simpson would release just one more album, 2008's Bittersweet World, which reportedly suffered from both terrible sales and reviews. Since then, she's been living low-key, except for a few sporadic acting gigs, getting married twice, and raising her kids. The Dixie Chicks The Dixie Chicks made national headlines in 2003 when lead singer Natalie Maine sounded off on her disapproval of the Iraq War during a show in London. Just so you know, we're ashamed the President of the United States is from Texas. The pushback from the fans was so severe that the Dixie Chicks were essentially blacklisted from almost every country radio station. And worse. It says Natalie Maines will be shot dead Sunday, July 6th. The group's next album, Taking the Long Way, debuted in 2006. It received critical acclaim and even topped the charts, but the accompanying tour suffered from uneven attendance, according to Billboard. It would take another 10 years and a complete toning down of Maine's once unapologetic political rhetoric for the Dixie Chicks to fully stage a comeback. Having completed a successful nostalgia tour in 2017, which the band turned into a live album, it seems the Chicks may have finally left the London incident behind. Robin Thicke Robin Thicke's career was hotter than ever after Blurred Lines shot him to the top of the charts in the summer of 2013. But within months, following that questionable VMAs duet with Miley Cyrus, things quickly unraveled. According to Billboard, this period also coincided with the estrangement of Thicke's wife, actress Paula Patton, for whom he then penned a hastily written and poorly received album in an attempt to win her back. We were childhood sweethearts, so you know she's uh, the you know best person I ever met. So I just thought it, the best, the least I could do would be to devote an album to her. It was two performances of songs from that album, Paula, that sealed Thick's fate and shuffled him into the has been zone. First up were the 2014 Billboard Music Awards when he debuted the song "Get Her Back" with the on the nose line, "I never should have raised my voice." Then, there were the BET Awards a month later, where things went decidedly downhill. Us Weekly described Thick singing Forever Love as, quote, looking tired and puffy-eyed, and sniffling his way through the performance. In the three and a half years since that teary-eyed misstep, Thick has barely made a blip on the screen, although he did tell New York Upstate in January 2018 that he's working on a new album. Michelle Shocked Rocker Michelle Schock may not be a household name, but in the alt-folk scene, she had quite a following, until she detonated it with an ill-conceived act of protest in March 2013. Schock interrupted her own gig at Yoshi's in San Francisco when she started citing anti-gay Bible passages. But the final blow for the singer, whose lyrics and audience were known to be liberally slanted, was when she used a homophobic slur on stage. Someone would be so gracious as to please tweet out, Michelle Shock just said from stage, God hates <laughs> The crowd revolted and immediately left the show. About a month later, and with many of her shows canceled, Shocked appeared on Piers Morgan and declared, No, I'm not homophobic. This all translated to a long period of estrangement with her once diehard fans. Shocked confessed to Dallas News in 2017 that the evening at Yoshi's was an intentional provocation, meant to strike back at digital piracy of her music. How exactly she meant to achieve that, we may never know. The Sex Pistols by the time legendary punk rockers the Sex Pistols took the stage at what would be their last concert for nearly two decades, the writing was already on the wall. According to The Telegraph, the band was on shaky ground, due in part to bassist Sid Vicious' debilitating heroin addiction, coupled with a poorly managed tour schedule that involved, quote, 800-mile drives through bleakest midwinter. On top of all that, lead singer Johnny Rotten had mentally checked out. He said, by that last gig, I'd lost interest. I'd become incapable of caring about writing another song for this outfit. I felt like, that's it, there's the full stop. I've achieved as much as I can in this environment. That feeling was the inspiration behind Rotten's infamously bad performance during the band's January 1978 show at the Winterland Ballroom in San Francisco. It was the final stop on the band's first, albeit brief, American tour. And it ended on a one-song encore of the Stooges' No Fun. As the tune concluded, Rotten famously asked, Ah ha ha! Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? Good night! 
Rotten subsequently quit the band. The group did reunite for a tour in 1996, sans Vicious, who overdosed on heroin and died in 1979. But it was just more of the same. Guitarist Steve Jones told the New York Daily News, We did a hundred shows, made a bit of dough, but we wanted to kill ourselves at the end. We really don't make enough to put up with each other. Bigoted comments? Believing in a flat earth? Showgirls? There's many ways for celebrities to find themselves on the wrong side of fame. Stay tuned to find out about stars who absolutely destroyed their careers in a matter of seconds. In June 2001, Beverly Hills 90210 alum Rebecca Gayhart accidentally struck and killed a third grader crossing a Los Angeles street. People reports that it was the star's alleged negligence that led to the tragedy, with police noting that other cars had seen the boy and stopped when Gayhart tried to pass them in the left lane and struck the child. She settled a wrongful death lawsuit with his family the following year, but the damage to her career was done. Since then, Gayhart's work has mostly been relegated to TV movies, guest starring roles in TV shows, and a handful of single seasons of television projects, such as Dead Like Me. Speaking with People, she credited her relationship with her then-husband, Eric Dane, as well as getting professional help through therapy for helping her through this time, adding, It's something that is with me every day, and it will be for the rest of my life. I don't think anyone could sit and say they got over something like this. I just don't think that's possible. It hasn't been for me. James Jimmy the Greek Snyder was one of the most successful sportscasters of his time, launching CBS Sports NFL Today in 1976 and remaining there for 12 years. So why'd he leave? Well, he was forced out after making some racist comments on air in 1988. There's not going to be anything left for the white people. I mean, all the players are black. I mean, the only thing that the whites control is the coaching jobs. As if that weren't bad enough, according to the Los Angeles Times, he took the outrageous step of alleging that black Americans were better athletes than white athletes, and that this disparity was thanks to slavery. Snyder was subsequently fired, and the Washington Post reported that the CBS broadcast group's president released a statement at the time, saying, Snyder made a number of remarks about black and white athletes, which had patently racist overtones. CBS wishes to categorically disassociate itself from these remarks. While he did publicly apologize, according to the Orlando Sentinel, Snyder added insult to injury when he later sued CBS for $20 million and further claimed that his firing aggravated his personal health problems. Following Snyder's 1996 death, Lim Banker, a famous sports better in Las Vegas, told the AP, He really just went downhill after that. It was a shame. He was real bitter. Brandy was an R&B and pop sensation in the late 1990s and early 2000s. She had hit songs, won a Grammy for The Boy Is Mine, starred on a popular TV series with Moesha, landed a judging stint on the first season of America's Got Talent, and even boasted a doll in her likeness. But that all changed at the end of 2006. TMZ reports that on December 30th, Brandy was driving at 65 miles per hour in Los Angeles when her Land Rover accidentally hit a Toyota Corolla. People noted that this led to a crash that involved two other vehicles. Tragically, the driver of the rear-ended Toyota, Awatef Abudiha, was killed in the accident. Brandy was not charged, but later settled a wrongful death suit with Abu Dia's two children, and her career never recovered after the tragedy. Her 2008 album, Human, was a commercial disaster. She lost her judging gig on America's Got Talent, and her brother, Ray J, essentially made the family notorious with his sex tape with Kim Kardashian. Not that Brandy's given up on her passions. While she wouldn't address the accident when she spoke with The Guardian in 2020, Brandy told the outlet, Sometimes you get caught up in being popular and relevant, and that makes you lose the reason why you're connected to music. I'm scared of that. I don't ever want to get to a point where I'm doing music for the wrong reasons. Natalia Kills and husband Willie Moon were co-judges on X Factor New Zealand. However, their stint on the show came to an end when the pair appeared to needlessly rip into a contestant in a 2015 audition, earning a reputation for the meanest and most ridiculous X Factor commentary ever. According to the Daily Mail, Kills alleged that contestant Joe Irvine, who simply wore a suit and sang for his audition, was attempting to copy her husband, saying, You're a laughingstock. It's cheesy. It's disgusting. I personally found it absolutely artistically atrocious. I am embarrassed to be sitting here in your presence having to even dignify you with an answer of my opinion. You make me sick. 
As if that already wasn't wildly unnecessary, then Moon decided to chime in. I feel like you're going to stitch someone's skin to your face and then kill everybody in the audience. With these remarks, the couple effectively killed their careers. According to People, they were fired from the show, and they also received so much hate online that Kills dropped her stage name and went back to publicly using her real name, Teddy Sinclair. As reported by Paper Magazine, these days the couple performs together under the totally non-ironic band name Cruel Youth. Rapper B.O.B. has laid low since his smash hit Airplanes in 2010, but he decided to pop back into the public consciousness in January 2016 to let everyone know that the earth is flat. As CNN reported, the rapper wrote amidst a series of since-deleted tweets, no matter how high an elevation you are, the horizon is always eye level. Sorry cadets, I didn't want to believe it either. As if that wasn't bad enough, B.O.B. got some heat from astrophysicist and cosmologist Neil deGrasse Tyson, who tried explaining to him that the planet is actually pretty round. B.O.B. responded with the diss track Flatline, which features a recording of Tyson discussing the formation of the Earth. It was the most listened to song the rapper had released since 2011, but not for the right reasons. As Billboard reported in 2020, B.O.B. opted to lay low following the ensuing backlash against his conspiracy theory beliefs, and the rapper himself has expressed regrets for how he decided to share his views on social media, saying, It definitely gets exhausting with people. When your inbox goes from girls sending you nudes to people sending you philosophy essays, it definitely takes some of the fun out of a cell phone. Howard Dean was a favorite to win the Democratic nomination for president in 2004. That is, until the former Vermont governor gave a speech at the Iowa caucus that January and delivered the scream heard round the world while attempting to pump up his crowd. <laughs> According to Esquire, this essentially ended his chances at ever winning the White House. ABC News reports that the media replayed the so-called Dean Scream gaffe constantly, with everyone from Dave Chappelle to Diane Sawyer offering commentary on it. Dean dropped out of the race a month later. Dean himself reflected on the incident to Esquire in 2016, saying, The honest truth is that I just wasn't ready for prime time. I came from a state of 600,000 people. I had an intensely passionate following. I wasn't anticipating how rough it would be, and we didn't really have much discipline on the campaign. I was an undisciplined candidate. Leaving off on a positive note, he added, There's not a lot I regret about it. I've had a lot of fun with it. I got to be friends with Dave Chappelle. I still use the speech once in a while. I get up and all of a sudden I slip into the speech. Troy Duffy is the director of the cult classic 90s film The Boondock Saints. His story is legendary. He wrote the screenplay on his breaks from Tending Bar and sold it to the since-disgraced producer Harvey Weinstein of Miramax, who also offered to buy the bar where Duffy worked and sign it over to him as part of the deal. Inspiring story, right? Well, according to The Guardian, Duffy reportedly turned into, quote, an abusive alcoholic megalomaniac who blew the deal after getting into an argument with Ewan McGregor. In the film Overnight, documentarians Tony Montana and Mark Brian Smith tracked Duffy's admittedly disastrous mishandling of his opportunity, and later told The Guardian that it was the McGregor incident that soured Weinstein on the deal. After Miramax dropped the film, Duffy accepted a lesser deal that left him with no distribution rights, meaning that when the film attained cult status upon DVD release, Duffy got nothing. And though the film's underground success eventually led to a sequel ten years later, it just barely made its money back at the box office and was also viciously panned by critics. Ray Rice's career ended in 2014 with a single punch, directed to his then fiance Janae Palmer. According to TMZ, the incident was captured on video, which includes Rice then dragging Palmer's unconscious body out of the elevator in which he attacked her. According to USA Today, Rice and Palmer married shortly after the incident, and the athlete avoided criminal charges by agreeing to enter into a pretrial diversion program. But he wasn't so lucky with the NFL. His team, the Baltimore Ravens, dropped him immediately. According to Sports Illustrated, the league suspended him indefinitely. Although he successfully sued them, won a monetary settlement for wrongful termination, and was reinstated as an unsigned free agent. 
As of this video, Rice remains unsigned after years of begging any team to bring him on, even pledging to donate his salary to charities emphasizing education and prevention of domestic violence. During an interview with CBS This Morning in 2018, Rice said of watching the video, I hate that person. I hate him. During my darkest moments, you know, I used to ask myself, how could she even be, want to support me? Like, but A lot of people wondered that. Before anyone starts feeling sorry for the admittedly repentant Rice, keep in mind that despite his fall from grace, Sports Illustrated reported that he still collected almost $27 million due to a contract he signed in July 2012. Everyone knows Katherine Heigl pretty much torpedoed her reputation with her remarks about the show that made her famous, Grey's Anatomy. But where Heigl's Grey's flub led to a slow career evaporation, co-star Isaiah Washington's resume took a kill shot when he got axed. The firing was due to a report that he used a gay slur while referring to co-star T.R. Knight while arguing with other co-star Patrick Dempsey, and then repeated the slur backstage at the Golden Globes. That was in 2007, and it would take six years for Washington to stage his Hollywood comeback. In 2013, he told HuffPost, After the incident at the Golden Globes, it just, everything just fell apart. I lost everything. I couldn't afford to have an agent. I couldn't afford to have a publicist for crisis management. Washington then laid low for years to escape from the negative media attention, claiming that a false narrative was created surrounding his onset remarks. Washington is now back to working regularly, thanks to his own efforts rebuilding his fan base via social media and collaborating on independent projects during his black ball period. He even returned to Grey's Anatomy in 2014 for a single episode, but we're guessing he steered clear of certain colleagues at lunch. In a surprisingly candid interview with the New York Daily News, Showgirls director Paul Verhoeven did not mince words when he took the blame for his movie derailing Elizabeth Berkley's acting prospects in the mid-90s, saying, Showgirls certainly ruined the career of Elizabeth Berkley in a major way. It made my life more difficult, but not to the degree it did Elizabeth's. Hollywood turned their backs on her. Verhoeven even attributed Berkeley's performance to his direction, but he admitted that the film ultimately failed to convey his vision. Berkeley has also publicly acknowledged the post-Showgirls destruction, notably during a tearful breakdown during a Dancing with the Stars rehearsal in 2013. Took a risk creatively and did Showgirls. You know, little did I know when it came out that it was going to be met with such criticism. But perhaps the saddest part of Berkeley's confession was her admission that her turn on Dancing with the Stars was so empowering that it felt, quote, like some sort of sentence was lifted, revealing how she thought it would prove to be her big career comeback after 22 years of industry stonewall. Winning an Academy Award is usually a golden ticket to A-list stardom for the lucky few actors who win them each year. And with comedian Monique's win for her powerful dramatic turn in 2009's Precious, it seemed like she was destined for that track. But the second she walked off that stage with her trophy in hand, everything went sideways. She wouldn't get another role for five years, in 2014's Blackbird, an indie flick that coincidentally starred fellow Hollywood outcast Isaiah Washington. According to a 2015 interview with The Hollywood Reporter, Monique claims she was finally told a few months prior by director Lee Daniels that she had been blackballed as a result of her husband's aggressive salary negotiation tactics. Monique went to TMZ and blasted Daniels, claiming that she believed he was behind her career downfall because she didn't thank him in her Oscar acceptance speech. Not surprisingly, this did not get Monique back into the good graces of the Hollywood elite, nor did her later doubling down on both Tyler Perry and Oprah Winfrey, whom she's also accused of conspiring against her. Add in her gender and race discrimination allegations against Netflix, and Monique's career may have been abruptly and unfairly shoved into an early grave. In October 2004, Ashley Simpson performed her hit single, Pieces of Me, on Saturday Night Live, and it went fine. However, when she returned to the stage to perform her next tune, Autobiography, things went south. The vocals for Pieces of Me began playing while Simpson's mic was down at her side. She tried to recover, for some reason, with a spontaneous hoedown dance before fleeing the stage. I feel so bad my band started playing the wrong song, and I didn't know what to do, so I thought I'd do a hoedown. Later, on 60 Minutes, she blamed her acid reflux for her reliance on a backing vocal track, 
Simpson later attempted comebacks, but the public wasn't having it, considering she was booed at her Orange Bowl performance in January 2005. Her record sales unfortunately never recovered. Opening up about the fallout from the ordeal on her e-reality TV series, Ashley and Evan, in 2018, Simpson reflected, "'You know, I had finished my album and it was out, and Pieces of Me was number one, and then all of a sudden, you know, happened, and it was like boom, and the world hated me for this SNL moment I had." This Australian DJ certainly wasn't a worldwide name prior to her career-shattering goof. But she is now, especially since her ill-advised antics even got the royal family mixed up in a tragic suicide in 2012. According to BuzzFeed, Mel Gregg posed as Queen Elizabeth and called the hospital where a pregnant Kate Middleton was being treated. She spoke with two nurses. First was Jacintha Saldana, who forwarded the call to another nurse who unwittingly told the DJ and her co-worker details of Middleton's condition. Three days later, reportedly distraught over her involvement with the breach of such a high profile patient's medical information, Saldana died by suicide. Greg and her co-host Michael Christian were suspended from the airwaves. Their show was cancelled and higher-ups called for a suspension of prank calls. Christian, who was a minor player in the call, returned to radio on a different station a few months later. Greg, however, filed a lawsuit against her employers, alleging that they had not maintained a safe workspace. They eventually settled, with the station publicly stating that Greg had objected to the airing of the prank call. Nevertheless, she also resigned from radio in December 2013. After a three-year hiatus, Greg returned to the airwaves, although she admits she's still apprehensive about being known for the infamous prank that ended in tragedy, saying on a current affair, "...there's not a minute that goes by that we don't think about that family and what they must be going through, and the thought that we may have played a part in that is gut-wrenching." As a singer-songwriter type with considerable guitar skills, a pop sensibility, and the looks of a teen idol, John Mayer became one of the most notable musicians of the early 2000s. Nominated for Best New Artist at the 2003 Grammys, he'd win seven trophies by decade's end. His first four albums were all certified at least double platinum by the RIAA, and he routinely topped the Billboard adult rock charts with hits like No Such Thing and Waiting on the World to Change. Then, Mayer gave an interview to Playboy in 2010 that left him waiting on the world to change its newfound distaste for him. He made a series of bizarre and discomforting comments about sex, race, and his ex-girlfriend Jessica Simpson, saying things like, "...that girl is like crack cocaine to me. It was like napalm. Sexual napalm." He also dismissed the notion that he dated a lot, claiming that he slept with fewer partners than he did in his early career. Mayer also claimed that he was loved by black people, then casually used the N-word and explained that he pursues mainly white women because his genitals are, quote, "...sort of like a white supremacist." Mayer laid low and didn't release any music for a couple years, moved to Montana, thought a lot about what he did and said, and never again recorded a multi-platinum certified LP. Sinead O'Connor was banned from Saturday Night Live after she tore up a picture of Pope John Paul II during her a cappella rendition of Bob Marley's War in 1992. Fight the real enemy! But the sacrilegious act protesting child abuse within the church did more than just get the bald-headed singer booted from late-night TV. According to The Atlantic, O'Connor was instantly reviled. At one demonstration, a number of her tapes, CDs, and records were run over by a steamroller, and within a year, she had vanished from the popular music scene. Billboard offered a more egalitarian take on O'Connor's post-SNL career stating that she did still successfully sell albums in the years that followed, though none of her songs ever made it back into the Hot 100 chart. And while it's unlikely that many can name a single Sinead O'Connor song outside of the smash hit Nothing Compares to You, everyone can probably cite at least one or two times she's made headlines in more recent years, be it her public and graphic pleas for sex or her Twitter feud with Miley Cyrus. Album sales or no, O'Connor has been nothing but a provocateur for decades now, a choice she made when she left her music career in tatters on the floor right beside that photo of the Pope. She later wrote in the Washington Post, "...I knew my action would cause trouble, but I wanted to force a conversation where there was a need for one. That is part of being an artist." 
Gary Busey was an acclaimed actor in the 1970s and 80s, even nabbing a Best Actor Oscar nomination for his titular role in 1978's The Buddy Holly Story. Unfortunately for the star, a stubborn stance and an instant disaster ended his shot at ever returning to that stratum of success. People report that Busey was an outspoken advocate against motorcycle helmets for years, despite a lot of data showing helmets prevent death and serious injury to riders and accidents. Fast forward to December 1988, Busey was involved in a motorcycle crash without a helmet. He needed hours of neurosurgery to remove blood clots from his brain. As he told the outlet, it was a critical situation. The right side of the brain, where the damage was, controls verbal and musical skills, emotional expression, and the ability to recognize visual patterns. After the operation, I couldn't talk, walk, swallow. I had temporarily lost my fine motor skills. I learned later that 50% of patients with head injuries like mine die. Thankfully, Busey survived, but after the accident, he struggled with drug addiction and still refused to wear a helmet. His career since the crash has been relegated to cameos and television work, landing no leading roles in anything beyond C-level straight-to-video fare. According to Billboard, following the success of secretly lip-syncing European musical act Boney M in the 1970s, producer Frank Farian attempted a similar charade by hiring some studio singers to record an album's worth of dance pop. He then recruited dancers Fab Morvan and Rob Pilatus to serve as the faces of Milli Vanilli. Despite how Morvan and Pilatus' speaking voices in interviews sounded nothing like the singing or rapping on their songs, record buyers didn't seem to notice or care. Lead single, Girl You Know It's True, was a huge hit in Europe, and Arista Records released the duo's debut album of the same name in the U.S. in early 1989. It spent eight weeks atop the Billboard album's chart and generated three number one hits. Millie Vanilli appeared on a Club MTV package tour that summer, miming to pre-recorded tracks. During a Connecticut show, the tape jammed and blared from speakers while the duo danced and vamped for a moment before fleeing the stage. In the pre-internet age, news of the mishap spread slowly, but by November 1990, Farian was forced to publicly admit the ruse. Morvan and Pilatus subsequently appeared at a press conference to return their Grammy Award for Best New Artist. Pariahs of pop culture, Pilatus and Morvan resurfaced in 1993 as Rob and Fab, with a self-titled album full of their real singing voices. According to Milli Vanilli's Behind the Music episode, the independently released record sold just 2,000 copies. In 1998, 32-year-old Pilatus was tragically found dead in a German hotel room of an accidental overdose. Comedian and actor Brian Dunkelman first started booking gigs in the late 90s and early 2000s, appearing in roles on sitcoms like Dharma and Greg and Friends. Then, in 2002, he was hired to co-host a summer replacement series for Fox, a progressive reality TV competition looking to discover and anoint a new pop music singing sensation. With co-host Ryan Seacrest, Dunkelman hosted the first season of American Idol, which launched Kelly Clarkson to superstardom. It could have sent Dunkelman's star rising too, as the show soon became the number one series on TV and ran for more than a decade had he not left after just one season. Dunkelman told Variety in 2016 that while he suspected producers might fire him in order to have Seacrest host the show solo, he quit instead, saying, I wanted to have an acting career, and I knew that leaving when I did would give me the best shot of accomplishing that. Still working on it. So a lot of people think that I made the biggest mistake in the history of television. I don't agree. I think I might have made the biggest mistake in history. Following electrifying early rock and roll stars like Elvis Presley and Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis was an ascendant superstar in the making. Lewis would work crowds into a frenzy with his frenetic piano playing and hot and bothered singing style. In 1957 and 1958, he hit the upper reaches of the American pop, country, and R&B charts with a string of rock formative classics like Whole Lot of Shakin' Goin' On and Great Balls of Fire. In May 1958, according to Ultimate Classic Rock, the 22-year-old Lewis embarked on a UK concert tour and brought along his new third wife, the bride, Myra Gale Brown, Lewis' 13-year-old third cousin. 
According to the Daily Mail, Lewis initially told the British press that Myra was 15, but once her real age was discovered, the police interviewed the couple. He was asked to leave his hotel and his tour was cut short. As Rolling Stone reports, the two stayed married for 13 years and had a couple of kids together, but Lewis was never able to gain back his rock star status. While he'd eventually be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for his early work, Lewis only ever had one more top 30 pop single after the marriage to Myra. It's hard to believe, but Saturday Night Live has been on the air for over 40 years. In that time, the show has logged a massive number of memorable musical performances, and a gig on the show can still make or break an artist's career. As the AV Club put it, SNL is easily the single most important television show on which not to bomb. In the cases of the following acts, a poor showing ended up putting a real damper on their futures. Sinead O'Connor Irish singer Sinead O'Connor caused a major stir in 1992 when her SNL performance evolved into a hugely controversial political statement. At the end of an a cappella rendition of Bob Marley's War, she ripped up a photo of Pope John Paul II and then said, Fight the real enemy! SNL producer Lorne Michaels was left to deal with more than 4,000 angry phone calls to NBC, and O'Connor was subsequently banned from the show. Amidst the backlash, she spent the rest of the decade making music. Though nothing became anywhere near as popular as a 1990 hit single, Nothing Compares to You. In 2003, she announced her retirement from music, though that proved to be short-lived. In 2010, O'Connor explained her beef with the Catholic Church, justifying her performance as a protest against priestly abuse. Writing in the Washington Post, she said, I knew my action would cause trouble, but I wanted to force a conversation when there was a need for one. That is part of being an artist. Ashley Simpson we haven't heard too much from Ashley Simpson lately, but back in 2004, she was still pretty relevant. But that all came crashing down on SNL. As Simpson started her second performance of the evening, the pre-recorded vocals for her first song, Pieces of Me, started playing. Panic-stricken, she did a weird little jig and then slipped off the stage as a band played on. At the end of the show, Simpson offered a hasty explanation. I feel so bad my band started playing the wrong song, and I know what to do, so I thought I'd do a hoedown. <laughs> I'm sorry. She later revealed that she'd been suffering from severe acid reflux and her father had insisted that she use a backing track. Afterwards, Simpson's career took a major dip. She did appear on SNL a second time the following year, but to little fanfare. After seeing more diminishing sales, Simpson has not released an album since 2008. Her personal life has remained busy though, as she's been married twice and has two children. Carmen if you've never heard of Carmen, there's a good chance their widely criticized 2012 Saturday Night Live appearance has something to do with that. The husband and wife duo of Amy and Nick Noonan originally found viral fame with a series of covers on YouTube, but on SNL, they performed two original compositions, and critics subsequently ripped them apart. Spins Mark Hogan said, This was hip hop even Mitt Romney could enjoy, though he seems to have a little bit more personality. In the years afterwards, Carmen's albums barely charted and their career fizzled, leaving SNL viewers to wonder. I wonder if they just imagine the whole thing. Since then, the band has gone on hiatus to focus on Amy's solo career as a new persona, Queen Herbie. Lana Del Rey Appearing on the January 14, 2012 SNL, Lana Del Rey's incredibly stiff performances of her songs, video games, and blue jeans were swiftly and widely panned. As Rolling Stone put it, her shaky, slightly dead-eyed Saturday Night Live debut was treated like a national emergency, inspiring weeks of debate. The reaction on Twitter at the time was brutal, with actress Juliette Lewis saying, Wow, watching this singer on SNL is like watching a 12-year-old in their bedroom when they're pretending to sing and perform. Hashtag sign of our times. It was so bad that the show addressed the situation the very next episode with Kristen Wiig as Del Rey. And I failed to reach the high bar set by past guests like Bubba Sparks, <laughs> the Baja Men, <laughs> and Shaggy. <laughs> But this story has a happy ending as Del Rey ultimately survived what could have been a career-ending gig. In fact, her career has been flourishing. Her album Born to Die was certified platinum, she's been nominated for multiple Grammys, and she's collaborated with The Weeknd and Stevie Nicks. For fans and critics alike, that SNL performance is now little more than a distant memory. It's no secret that some celebrities seek longevity through publicity stunts, crafting memorable moments just to create a buzz. Whether it's a secret makeout sesh on a beach or a button-pushing tweet, many stars know how to work an audience in both obvious and subtle ways. However, despite the well-worn saying, there's no such thing as bad publicity, we think some stars would beg to differ. The following publicity stunts only ended up hurting these celebrities' careers. 
Kathy Griffin Brash comedian Kathy Griffin essentially became famous by poking fun at her own struggling celebrity status. But her signature Say Anything brand got her in an intense amount of trouble when a political stunt totally backfired. In May 2017, a photograph of Griffin holding a bloodied model of President Donald Trump's head circulated online, and the backlash was severe. In an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, Griffin claims that she received tons of violent threats and was investigated for possible conspiracy to assassinate. Many venues where she was scheduled to perform were forced to cancel due to threats of violence. And she even lost her long-running New Year's Eve gig with Anderson Cooper. Griffin issued an apology. I beg for your forgiveness. I went too far, I made a mistake, and I was wrong but later took it back. I'm no longer sorry. The whole outrage was BS. The whole thing got so blown out of proportion, and I lost everybody. Needless to say, Griffin will be on damage control for a long time to come. Morton Downey Jr. When viewership of The Morton Downey Jr. Show declined in the late 80s, Downey Jr. apparently took matters into his own hands. According to the Los Angeles Times, news broke in 1989 that Downey was attacked by skinheads in a San Francisco airport bathroom. Downey claimed that three neo-Nazis held him down, cut his hair, and covered his face, shirt, and pants in swastikas. Authorities were suspicious, noting that the swastikas were backwards, as if someone had been looking in a mirror when they drew them. Scissors and a felt-tip marker were found in a toilet. In other words, officials suspected Downey staged his victimization. An airport spokesman said, Our preliminary investigation shows that this was self-inflicted. For whatever reason, we don't know. We can only assume it was for publicity. The guy definitely generated publicity, enough to get his show canceled soon afterward. Justin and Janet The 2004 Super Bowl halftime show not only birthed the phrase wardrobe malfunction, it also led to a pop star's undoing. As Justin Timberlake was singing a Rock Your Body lyric about, well, removing clothes, he just so happened to rip a breastplate from Janet Jackson's top and expose her breast to the world. The performers claim it was an accident, but few believe that to be true. The ripple effect from the nipple effect was enormous. For one of the performers, that is. According to Rolling Stone, Jackson was reportedly blacklisted from MTV, VH1, and all Viacom radio stations. Her invite to the Grammys was rescinded and her career went dark for years. Meanwhile, Timberlake won two Grammys that year, his music continued to play across the country, and he was invited back to headline another halftime show in 2018. It would take a decade for the Federal Communications Commission to own up to its unequal treatment following the publicity stunt. FCC Chairman Michael Powell told ESPN in 2014, I personally thought that was really unfair. It all turned into being about her. In reality, if you slow the thing down, it's Justin ripping off her breastplate. Ashanti Leading up to her 2008 album release, Ashanti wasn't the megastar she had once been. Maybe that's why she felt like she needed to make a big noise with the album's promotion. The plan was to use gotcha grams as a promotional tool, enabling fans to send fake news stories to unsuspecting friends that would lead them to believe their lives were in danger. The violent ads led to anti-violence protests, and Ashanti's album sales suffered, resulting in her first album that failed to go platinum. The singer was subsequently dropped by her label. A CNN correspondent wrote at the time that Ashanti would have to resort to lame PR stunts to sell records is as much an indictment of her label as it is of the singer. Sullying her act in the hopes that it would translate into album sales didn't work. Not all press is good press. Some actors leave their most popular roles to find even more success. Think George Clooney or Bruce Willis. But sometimes that doesn't go according to plan. Here are some actors who destroyed their careers by walking away from hit roles. For 15 seasons, Polly Perrette played fan favorite forensic scientist Abby Shudo on NCIS. In 2018, however, things took a dark turn when she suddenly left the show and made a series of cryptic tweets, including one about co-star Mark Harmon, who was supposedly the reason behind her immediate departure, saying, There is a machine keeping me silent and feeding false stories about me. A very rich, very powerful publicity machine. No morals, no obligation to truth, and I'm just left here reading the lies trying to protect my crew, trying to remain calm. He did it. Harmon hasn't responded to Perrette's allegations, but CBS's Kelly Call, the network's president of entertainment, confirmed in a public statement that she did indeed come to the network and that it had been resolved to everyone's satisfaction. I will always be grateful for just the incredible honor of playing Abby. After leaving NCIS, her career slowed down considerably. Holly will be starring in a 2020 CBS pilot called Broke, but unfortunately, the new sitcom hasn't garnered much buzz. 
it really makes me sad. Will Wheaton first received acclaim for playing Gordy Lachance in the 1986 coming-of-age film Stand By Me. But it wasn't until the following year he landed the career-defining role of Wesley aboard the USS Enterprise on Star Trek The Next Generation. After four seasons on Star Trek, Wheaton left the show in order to pursue different opportunities in TV and film, but sadly for him, this move sunk his career early on. He explained during a Star Trek reunion at the Calgary Expo in 2012, I left Star Trek The Next Generation when I was 18 years old, and initially, I thought it was a really smart business career move. In some ways it was, and in more ways it wasn't. And what I was unprepared for was how much I was going to miss the people on this stage. Wheaton's career never reignited like he hoped, despite a reoccurring role playing himself on The Big Bang Theory for about a decade. Back when American Idol first aired in 2002, it became an instant hit. The reality TV singing competition launched the careers of Kelly Clarkson, Carrie Underwood, and Fantasia. One who failed to launch was Ryan Seacrest's co-host of the first season, Brian Dunkelman. Dunkelman left Idol to pursue, wait for it, a career in stand-up comedy. Seacrest, on the other hand, hasn't faced the same career obstacles Dunkelman did after leaving Idol. In fact, he's doing just fine after inking a $21 million deal with E! in 2006 and co-hosting live with Kelly and Ryan. Dunkelman's plan didn't quite hash out. Knew they'd continue on this show. I thought I'm never gonna have an acting career. And bottom line, I just announced in Daily Variety that I was quitting. In a September 2019 GQ article, he said, it came down to whether to keep both of us or go with one host. They decided to go with one and obviously I wasn't the one. They told me that I quit before they could deliver the news. He revealed in a January 2019 tweet that he'd started driving an Uber to support his family during a particularly rough patch in their lives. All hope is not lost, however. Dunkelman saw a return to the stage hosting Family Feud Live Celebrity Edition and relaunched his comedy career in late 2019. After more than 17 years off the air, the beloved and iconic sci-fi series Doctor Who returned in 2005 with Christopher Eccleston cast as the Ninth Doctor. The marriage seemed bright at first, but after just one season, he quit because of creative differences with the show's producer. He was replaced by David Tennant, who held the role for the next eight years and became a megastar. Speaking to The Guardian in 2018, Eccleston revealed that his decision to leave the show had almost cost him his entire career. I gave them a hit show and I left with dignity, and then they put me on a black List. I was carrying my own insecurities as it was something I had never done before and then I was abandoned, vilified in the tabloid press, and blacklisted. Beverly Hills 90210 was an instant classic when it premiered in 1990. The entire cast of attractive young adults were virtual unknowns when the teen drama first debuted, but after a decade-long run, the actors truly became megastars. But that success didn't last long for Jason Priestley, who played teen heartthrob Brandon Walsh. After nine seasons on Beverly Hills, he decided to leave because he felt his character had run its course. Priestley told CNN in 2014, In retrospect, I do regret leaving. Understanding what I do now about story and character, I believe that Aaron Spelling was pushing the story in a direction that would have had Brandon and Kelly end up together at the end of the show. And I think I probably should have stuck around to its fruition. Priestley attempted to relaunch his career again in 2019 with a role in the series revival BH90210. But unfortunately for him, it was canceled after just one season. Sadly, for fans of Beverly Hills 90210, Brandon and Kelly never got together. Alicia Lisi Gorenson played the original Becky on ABC's Roseanne, but following five seasons on the show, Lisi decided to call it quits to go to college. After she left, Becky's role was taken over by Sarah Chalk, who later went on to Scrubs fame. The show adjusted, but made reference to the bizarre change often. They say she's the same, but she isn't the same. Gorenson returned to share the role with Chalk three seasons later, but left the show the following season. Gorenson's acting career was off to a promising start when she landed a role in two indie hits, 1995's How to Make an American Quilt and 1997's Boys Don't Cry. Her career slowed down quickly afterwards, and she mostly took on guest roles on shows like Law & Order SVU, Damages, Fringe, and Sex in the City. But things changed in 2018 when she reprised her role as Becky in the Roseanne reboot. The show premiered to massive ratings, but was canceled after Barr posted racist tweets about former Obama advisor Valerie Jarrett. Gorenson once wrote in a now-deleted tweet, devastated by the cancellation of Roseanne on ABC, but more devastating are the effects of hate speech and racism on individuals and society. Thank you for your support. And in the spirit of our amazing crew, spread love, not hate. But all is not lost. Gorenson still plays the role of Becky once again in the current Roseanne-less The Connors.
These once popular reality stars managed to ruin their fame by spreading vicious rumors, getting locked up, and threatening to harm their co-stars, among other offenses. Here's how your former favorite TV personalities ruined their careers. Hey, girlfriends! Why don't we all have some drinks and talk about how I think Portia has no class? You heard me, Portia. Mike the Situation Sorrentino made his ascent into B-list celebrity status after appearing on the MTV reality series Jersey Shore. His bizarrely charming personality and rock-hard abs proved to be bankable assets, so the cash started pouring in. As far as I know, everybody loves the situation. And if you don't love the situation, I want to make you love the situation." Apparently, neither Sorrentino's abs nor charm worked on the federal government. According to TMZ, the reality star's life did a 180 when he was nabbed by the IRS for failing to pay taxes on nearly $9 million in earnings. Forbes reported that Sorrentino entered a guilty plea on one count of tax evasion in January 2018, while his brother, Mark, pleaded guilty to one count of aiding in the preparation of a fraudulent tax return. The disgraced reality star began his eight-month prison sentence at Otisville Federal Correctional Institution in Otis. Otisville, New York, in January 2018. But before he left, the situation had one final farewell shindig, his November 2018 wedding to longtime girlfriend Lauren Pesci, followed by a honeymoon in the Santa Catalina Mountains. It's bittersweet the newlyweds will spend their first few months as husband and wife away from each other. Luckily, once Sorrentino's sentence is over, he can reunite with her and his Jersey Shore family vacation castmates, since MTV gave the reality show reboot the green light for season three. Prison first, but GTL forever. In an iconic video clip from Teen Mom OG, executive producer Morgan J. Freeman tells Farrah Abraham that if she continues to work in the adult film industry, Teen Mom will not continue to have her on the show. Abraham, who's never been one to back down, immediately claps back. Who are you to tell someone to choose one thing? Shoot me for being who I am. Who is he? Well, he was your employer, Farah. Abraham refused to agree to the stipulations, and with MTV's cameras no longer documenting the mother of one, her life flipped upside down. According to TMZ, Abraham signed five-year leases in 2016 for two boutiques she operated at a mall in Lakeway, Texas. After shutting their doors, Abraham allegedly stopped paying rent on both storefronts and was sued for owing over $100,000 in past due rent. Radar Online stated Abraham was also sued by her lawyer in November 2018 for an outstanding bill, and an additional $12,000 lawsuit was filed by a promoter after she backed out of a boxing match. After being hit with multiple lawsuits, Abraham reportedly had to move in with her father and his fiance. People magazine confirmed that Brandy Glanville had been given the axe after season 5 of The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills due to a series of tumultuous verbal altercations with her castmates. A source told People, Brandy got too big for her britches. She was a diva and it came around to bite her. By the end, she couldn't get along with anyone and no one wanted to shoot with her. Another source told Us Weekly that the show's executive producer Andy Cohen was also a bit peeved with her, stating, Andy thinks her actions aren't a good look for the show. Perhaps Glanville should have put in more effort to play nice because without the show, she suffered from some pretty intense hardships. While speaking to TMZ after her firing, Glanville revealed her financial situation had been strained since she left the program. Being sweet and cordial is probably a better move in terms of job security, but without Glanville, the show is definitely missing the dramatic, combative villainess. Teresa Giudice seemed to have it all when she made her debut on The Real Housewives of New Jersey. She had oodles of cash at her disposal and a mega mansion that she shared with her four daughters and her husband, Joe. Giudice was living quite a charmed life, up until the IRS caught wind of her and her husband's shady dealings, which included bankruptcy fraud, mail fraud, and conspiracy to commit wire fraud, to name a few. Giudice and her husband pleaded guilty to the charges, with Teresa looking at up to 27 months in prison. I got stuck with being involved. Her husband began serving a 41-month prison term in March 2016 and faced possible deportation back to his native Italy after he admitted to failing to pay nearly $1 million in taxes. The Real Housewife was ultimately sentenced to 15 months behind bars herself, beginning her prison stint on January 5, 2015. She was also ordered to pay $400,000 in restitution and $13 million for her bankruptcy. Her prison days may be behind her now, but Judice's dodgy financial mistakes could leave a stain on her reality TV. TV career forever. When you think of MTV's The Hills, you probably instantly think of Heidi Montag and her boyfriend-turned-husband Spencer Pratt, the couple better known to fans as Spidey. On the series, Spencer was the bad boy and Heidi was the one who so desperately wanted their relationship to work out. Despite her BFF Lauren Conrad calling Spencer a sucky person, Montag stood by his side, causing major discord in their friendship. Unlike a few of the other celebs on our list, Montag's descent from fame had to do with her own desire to be famous. Even the reality star's husband revealed, what we learned is you can be 
too famous. According to the Daily Beast, the plastic surgery-obsessed Montag and Pratt blew through all their money after their MTV days were over and the paid nightclub appearances dried up. They even had to resort to shacking up in Pratt's parents' beach house. Her failing superstardom, which was once her bread and butter, left her broke, created rifts with her family members, and made other reality shows hesitant to book her for gigs. But you have to realize what I've been through, and you have to realize that I've been through so much pain. We're interested to see how things will fare for Montag on MTV's The Hills' New Beginnings. The drama here started on season 9 of The Real Housewives of Atlanta when cast member Portia Williams gossiped behind castmate Candy Burris' back, insinuating that Burris was an undercover lesbian. Once news got back to Burris, she revealed that she and Williams had actually shared a kiss after a boozy night at an after-hours club, and also alleged that Williams had offered to perform a sex act on her that same night. <laughs> This caused Williams to go on the defensive and unleash a fury of accusations, including a rumor that Burris had a kinky sex dungeon in her home. She said I had a Why sex dungeon. You know, I if I had one, I would tell everybody about it because I don't care. During a cast trip to Hawaii, Williams said that she heard a rumor from an unnamed person that Burris and her husband, Todd Tucker, had plans to drug Williams and their mutual friend, Shamia Morton, in order to have sex with them. During the reunion episode, castmate Phaedra Parks confirmed she was the one who repeated the rumor after receiving the information from another unnamed source. Bravo TV executive producer Andy Cohen revealed to E! News that after the season wrapped, none of the castmates agreed to film with Parks for season 10, putting an end to her time on the show. Derek Dillard, who starred alongside his wife Jill Duggar on TLC's Counting On, took to his Twitter to discuss Jazz Jennings, the transgender star of TLC's I Am Jazz, in an insensitive and hurtful tweet. Dillard's tweet read, What an oxymoron, a reality show which follows a non-reality. Transgender is a myth. Gender is not fluid, it's ordained by God. Jennings fans clapped back in her defense, which prompted Dillard to dig his hole a little bit deeper, tweeting, I want to be clear, I have nothing against him, I only have issue with the words and definitions being proper propagated here. Online users were disgusted that he purposely used the wrong pronoun to refer to Jennings, but before the verbal fisticuffs could escalate, TLC released a statement via Twitter in which they told viewers Dillard would no longer be featured in the series, writing, Derek's personal statements do not reflect the views of the network. Dillard seemed to take the firing in stride, but less than a month later he decided he needed to clear things up in a tweet that read, For the record, I was never fired. I just felt it best for my family to cut ties months ago, as we are heading in a different direction. Um, uh, whatever you say, dude. In 2000, Richard Hatch outsmarted his competition to become the first winner of the American version of Survivor, winning $1 million. Unfortunately, he neglected to pay taxes on his earnings, something which he admitted to Forbes. Hatch stated he asked for an extension to file the IRS paperwork through his accountant, and although he claimed to be in communication with the federal government, they slapped him with an indictment for willful evasion two years later. Instead of taking a plea deal like he was advised to do, Hatch decided to go to trial where he was eventually found guilty on all 10 criminal counts. The Survivor champion was looking at 47 years in prison, so we're sure he breathed a sigh of relief when he was sentenced to only three. Upon his 2009 release, he headed back to reality TV to appear in various shows, including Celebrity Apprentice. But Uncle Sam came knocking once again after Hatch failed to refile his 2000 and 2001 taxes and neglected to pay an outstanding tax bill of $2 million. He was sentenced to an additional nine-month jail term in March 2011 and was given 26 months of supervised release, which means he missed out on watching the finale of Celebrity Apprentice in the comforts of his own home. It's just life. Fans of Bravo's Southern Charm were floored when Thomas Ravenel's September 2018 arrest for second-degree assault and battery was reported by People magazine. The alleged victim, known as Nanny Don, had also been featured on the series. Police began investigating the charges in May 2018 after Don claimed Ravenel corralled her into his bedroom, dropped his pants, blocked the door, and allegedly ripped her clothes off. Following Ravenel's arrest, Bravo confirmed that he had been axed from the show. An insider added in a follow-up article by People that his Southern Charm co-stars were relieved not to have to deal with with Thomas on the show anymore. A second woman claimed in a blog post that Ravenel also sexually assaulted her mother, Debbie Holloway Perkins, in 2015 after they matched on Tinder. The former reality star denied both allegations in a statement through his lawyer, though he allegedly paid Debbie a $200,000 settlement in June 2016, according to Us Weekly. Things only got worse from there. While entangled in a bitter custody battle with his ex-girlfriend and fellow Southern Charm cast member Catherine Dennis, The Blast reported that Ravenel sued Bravo and the show's producers in November 2018 to prevent them from airing unaired footage, leaving many fans to wonder what else the disgraced reality star was trying to hide. 
They may have risen to fame at the hands of millions of subscribers, but for these content creators, the very platform that gave them a voice would become a proverbial prison for their sins. Here are the YouTubers whose careers bombed faster than you can say, hit the bell. Jared Knobenauer, also known as YouTube gamer Pro Jared, lost thousands of subscribers in 2019 after his wife, cosplayer Heidi O'Farrell, accused him of infidelity. According to O'Farrell, Jared had an affair with fellow YouTube gamer Holly Conrad. Claiming her husband had been involved with Conrad for months, O'Farrell tweeted, I have proof, explicit conversations and photographs of their relationship. He was promising me that he was committed to our relationship at the time and promising her he was breaking up with me. Thanks, Holly. <laughs> Jared hit a million subs in 2018, but after his wife trashed him on Twitter, the gamer lost over 100,000 subscribers in a single day. Prompted by O'Farrell's claims, The Verge reported some fans came forward alleging he'd solicited explicit photos from them. Jared admitted that he'd exchanged photos with consenting adults on occasion and apologized. I'm not super sure what to do with this channel. It's, it's just me again. I no longer have a team with me. He's since been dropped from his agency, and many in the gaming community have distanced themselves from anything pro-Jared. Is it cruel to keep a pet fox on a vegan diet? That's the question that the BBC asked when the media caught wind of Sonia Say, a vegan YouTuber who owns a fennec fox named Jumanji. They create all a lie, and they just start sharing this lie, and this lie goes viral. The creator drew the wrath of the internet when she shared a picture of a thin-looking Jumanji on Instagram. One outraged Twitter user said that the fox looked, quote, extremely malnourished, while other YouTubers encouraged their subscribers to report Say to PETA. Yet, Say stood firm, claiming that Jumanji's apparent weight loss was due to hair loss, claiming via Facebook, in all pictures, he weighs around the same, which is a normal weight for a fennec fox. But that wasn't enough to convince everyone that Jumanji's diet was a healthy one. According to The Independent, fennec foxes are, quote, mostly carnivorous animals. Although it's tough to gauge the full impact the scandal had on Say's career, as of late 2019, she stalled out at less than 8,000 subscribers. Due to all of that, I had to end up making my accounts private because I was receiving a lot of harassment and a lot of death threats, and it's not cool. Makeup vlogger James Charles lost subscribers in record numbers in 2019 after a drama that engulfed a number of YouTube creators. It all began when Charles promoted a wellness brand that his friend and mentor Tati Westbrook considers a direct rival to her own business. I also want to give a quick shout out to Sugar Bear Hair, so if you guys want to check them out, you can swipe up. Westbrook cut ties with Charles and the hashtag JamesCharlesIsCancelled began trending worldwide on Twitter. He shed a whopping 2 million subscribers in three days. Charles said in a since-deleted video, I'm so disappointed in myself that I ruined a relationship that did mean so much to me. Admitting that he may not have fully acknowledged her influence on his career, he said it was Tati who believed in him before anyone else did, and who offered him undying support as he grew into a brand. Charles added, What sucks the most is that I know there's nothing I can say or do to ever earn that friendship or trust back. The whole Charles versus Westbrook thing took some unexpected twists and turns before it finally got smoothed over. But it was relatively easy to follow when compared to the drama that blew up the year before. Often referred to as drama get in, it all kicked off when Gabriel Zamora posted a picture of himself and makeup vloggers Manny MUA, Nikita Dragon, and Laura Lee giving the finger shortly after the release of Shane Dawson's doc series, The Secret World of Jeffree Star. Jesus, take the wheel. What was suspected to be a call-out aimed at Starr's alleged past racism was later confirmed as exactly that by Zamora per BuzzFeed News. But perhaps the biggest loser in the whole scandal was Laura Lee. All the creators that went against Jeffree Star suffered career blows, but the majority of them just about managed to stay afloat, either via damage control apology videos or by throwing their accomplices under the bus. But Star's fans unearthed some seriously offensive tweets from Lee's past in which she insulted both African and Asian people with racial slurs, according to Cosmopolitan. Her deplorable tweets were more than enough to get her canceled, but she wound up driving the final nail through her own coffin with a widely mocked apology. She shed a whopping 240,000 subscribers in a single week after she attempted to explain herself in a video that the majority of people weren't exactly buying. I'm so sorry. 
So sorry to you guys. One Twitter user wrote of the dramatic performance, she couldn't even produce fake tears, so she had to resort to an awful acting job. It hurts me so bad to disappoint you all who have supported me for so many years. Ouch. Divorce is never an easy thing to go through, and some celebrities are known for entering into relationships that turn out to be short-lived. When a match made in Hollywood goes sour, the aftermath isn't always pretty, and it often precedes one member of the failed couple's career going belly up. Odds are, if you enter into the Kardashian family in even the smallest of capacities, your reputation is at risk. The proof is in the long list of ex-friends, ex-stylists, ex-boyfriends, and ex-husbands. Such was the case for NBA star Chris Humphreys, who became the laughing stock of both Hollywood and the basketball scene after his highly publicized marriage to Kim Kardashian ended after just 72 days. I knew, like, honeymoon, it wasn't gonna work out. Yeah. On the honeymoon, you knew. Yeah. After the split, Humphreys was even booed during basketball games, and his career bounced around the league from team to team. He signed with the Philadelphia 76ers in September 2017, but before he could play one game for them, he was waived from their roster. He was unable to sign with any other team, and he announced his retirement in March 2019. But not all is lost. Humphreys has found a new passion in life, and it has nothing to do with living in the limelight. He co-owns several Five Guys burger shops and is a franchisee of a salad eatery. We bet the Kardashians probably aren't eligible for a friends and family discount. Robin Thicke dominated the charts in 2013 for the entire summer with his hit single, Blurred Lines. But then his career essentially died overnight after his wife, Paula Patton, filed for divorce in October 2014, citing irreconcilable differences. Thicke tried to win back Patton by releasing the sappy, critically maligned album Paula in 2014, but it was apparently a flop with both its namesake and his fans. In the United Kingdom, it sold just 530 copies in its debut week. From there, things only got worse. Months after filing to end their marriage, Patton accused Thick of cheating on her with several different women and also accused him of physical and emotional abuse, infidelity, and drug and alcohol addiction. Amidst a bitter custody battle for their son, Julian, Patton asked the court to grant her a temporary restraining order against her ex. The couple were then eventually ordered to share joint custody of their son. Thick was eventually able to land a fun new gig in 2019 as a judge on The Masked Singer, but his music career remains in dire need of resuscitation. Jesse James became a household name thanks to his chop shop reality show, Monster Garage, which aired from 2002 to 2007. But his rough around the edges public profile skyrocketed even more when he married Sweetest Pie actress Sandra Bullock. America fell in love with the unlikely pair, especially when she thanked him in speech after speech on her way to an Oscar win for 2009's The Blind Side. But instead of concentrating on celebrating her Oscar, Bullock had to deal with rumors that James cheated on her with tattoo model Michelle Bombshell. McGee. He insisted that the majority of the allegations against him were untrue and unfounded, but that didn't stop his wife from filing for divorce in April 2010. A month before the divorce announcement, Us Weekly published a picture of James wearing Nazi memorabilia and recreating Adolf Hitler's infamous salute. Between that and his alleged infidelity, his career was pretty much over. I knew I would get caught eventually, and I think I wanted to get caught. Meg Ryan lost her title as America's Sweetheart after she and her husband of nine years, actor Dennis Quaid, announced their split in July 2000. Their shattered relationship took a turn when it was reported that Ryan had been having an affair with her Proof of Life co-star, Russell Crowe. She later admitted to InStyle that Crowe was there at the end of her marriage, but that the divorce wasn't his fault. She then shifted blame and accused Quaid of cheating on her. Quaid clapped back by telling the New York Daily News, I find it unbelievable that Meg continues publicly to rehash and rewrite the story of our relationship. Following the divorce, Ryan has spent much of her time out of the spotlight, appearing in only a handful of movies. Still, she appears to be focused on the future. In November 2018, she announced her engagement to rock star John Mellencamp. That same year, she signed on to produce and possibly star in a new comedy series on NBC. There was a time in American history when countless viewers tuned in to watch John and Kate Gosselin and their eight children on the TLC reality series John and Kate Plus Eight. Even the special to announce their separation was seen by millions. My goal is peace for the kids, and um, if peace needs to be brought about by this, then 
I'm in agreeance. After splitting, Kate landed a spot on Dancing with the Stars and managed to salvage at least part of a reality TV career with the spin-off series Kate Plus 8. John, on the other hand, hasn't had nearly as much luck. In 2013, Entertainment Tonight reported that he was living in a cabin without internet while waiting tables at a restaurant. He was later reportedly fired from that job for not showing up to his shifts, according to an insider who talked to Radar Online. And if that wasn't enough, he also tried his hand at DJing. 